uh, we've come to the last event of the day. It's actually the one I've been looking forward to in many ways the most. Um, and we've invited six students from the Graduate School of Journalism to join us on stage and share their impressions of the stories that they heard from the speakers and the discussions and to challenge us to think about how we communicate these important issues to the broader public. Uh, I do want to apologize. We're going to be shaving their time a little bit short, but I'd like to ask all of you if you'll indulge us to stay until about 5.45 rather than the stated end time of 5.30. That's our target right now. So to moderate this final panel, I am pleased to introduce Edwin Dobb from the Graduate School of Journalism. He's a member of our advisory committee and an active participant in planning today's program. And Mr. Dobb is a former editor at the Sciences and an independent writer and environmental journalist whose work has appeared in Harper's, the New York Times, National Geographic, and other publications. He's an active participant in our night program in environmental journalism here at Berkeley, and also an adjunct professor in the environmental studies program at the University of Montana. This semester, he's teaching a class, Telling Environmental Stories, and he's invited six students from that class to join us today for the end of the program. Edwin, and please join us. Okay. So uh, it has been, it's been a long day, and we are running a little late. I don't know about you, but I'm uh, overwhelmed in a good way by uh, the discussion, and we certainly, I think, um, I speak for the group, um, got a lot of ideas for stories, um, or at least got a lot of ideas. Um, let me just quickly say that my colleague and I, Mark Shapiro from the, from the journalism school, were um, uh, terrifically pleased to find that the planning group was not only multidisciplinary, um, and uh, was forced by Graham Fleming to figure out how to work together, um, which was it's kind of an evil genius that way. And it worked, um, but also to learn that um, this group was truly committed to reaching out to society to make its expertise available um, to the community, to the... Okay. Uh, to make it the expertise, the considerable expertise and experience of the Berkeley uh, uh, community uh, to society at large, decision, making, decision makers, policy makers, uh, and, and the public, and um, not only to identify and assess potential uh, impacts of global climate change, uh, but actually to help society prepare for it, mitigate its effects, compensate, and so on. So uh, Mark and I, on behalf of the journalism school, we're really pleased to be part of this effort. So we see this today, although we've gone through this months-long planning process, as actually the beginning of a conversation between the journalism school and journalism on, on, on the Berkeley campus and the rest of the campus around this most um, urgent issue. Um, and the conversation today, then, is that in the spirit of the start of this, of this um, process of collaboration, see where it might go. Um, I'll do, I'm going to quickly introduce um, um, the six students who are generous enough to, to come today, and then uh, we're going to ask a couple of questions about stories and ideas and see where we get, and then you cut us off when we're <laughs> we run out of time. Um, okay, on my immediate left, I got uh, Zach St. George, this is, and then uh, Tanya Dimitrova, um, <laughs> Mateo Hoke, um, Jean Spencer, uh, Tawanda. Kanhima and um, Eric Newman. Uh, sorry. And I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go one at a time and um, um, ask them about uh, possible story ideas that they picked up during the, the, the course of the day. So Zach, um, and, or, and or any particular ideas, uh, revelations, um, um, uh, anything that impressed you about what you saw today? Yeah, you know, I think uh, I think all of you that I watched speak, um, you know, all really working on some interesting things. I think some of you did an especially good job of uh, disguising that sometimes. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, but but really, the the thing that I kept hearing over and over again um, that really stood out to me was this idea of climate change. As you know, often the way we're going to see it is a local issue, and yet um, I think the solutions a lot of the time are going to need to be global, and uh, still still working on how to overcome that, but. 
Well, I was uh, impressed and inspired by some really ingenious um, ideas from the um, flood defense panel, for example. Um, Christina Hill mentioned a lot of um, work that's been done, for example, in, in Japan. They are building super dikes, and people, instead of living behind the dike, live on top of the dike. And this way, they use the water. Um, and the, as the dike is bigger, it's less likely to break. Or people in Hamburg, where they have an entire part of the city, half a district, which is built, prepared for flooding. All the buildings, um, actually, the living quarters start one floor off the ground. And the underground garages are um, waterproof. And there are sidewalks one level above, so people can actually use the space, and, and they're not really looking um, at the at, at flooding events as something really dangerous and scary. And she actually had a picture of parents taking their children out to play by the water of the flood, which is kind of unthinkable in places like, uh, um, I guess, along the Mississippi Delta. Yeah, again, I'd like to kind of echo uh, the statements of Zach and, and that, um, you know, not being able to sit on, in on every panel uh, is, of course, a natural disadvantage. But what I did here was um, a lot of phenomenal research being done, and it's important research that um, we, <laughs> sorry, that um, I think the journalists up here care a lot about. That's why we're in this class. Um, that being said, um, the way the information is presented is, is vital to the stories that we tell and the way you convey that information to us and then to a larger audience. Um, if your graphics are hard to read, <laughs> your graphics are terrible. Like, they need to be redone. And <laughs> if, if, if you have to think about a graphic, it needs to be redone. Um, please look online, go to KDMC website, get some tutorials on how to build graphics. It's important. These stories can be told in much more concise ways through visual elements, and that's why you guys use PowerPoint so much. Um, I'll, I'll just leave it at that. As far as stories go, just, uh, just a quick, uh, you know, uh, unsolicited advice. Um, it helps us. It really does. It helps us tell stories to a broader audience. Um, as far as a, a story idea goes, um, the idea of uh, re kind of reimagining the, uh, the bay and, and how we build houses um, along the bay, potentially using uh, the resources of the wealthy to protect uh, more vulnerable elements of our population uh, from flooding, I found very fascinating. So I have no advice, uh, but um, I, two things that I, I thought were, two things that kind of jumped out at me were one was the um, carbon credits for family planning. I think it's a great idea. <laughs> um, and another one, this is a little bit more wonky and obscure, but I was really interested in the um, pricing predictability, because I think uh, when you're talking about water, people don't want to pay more. Um, but then they're left depending on unpredictable water supplies. And, and if you're able to put a price on what that, that really costs people. I think that's an interesting angle. I think it's hard to convey. Uh, they were discouraging me from this story because it's, it's very abstract. But I mean, I think when you look at LA, which is a city that has, um, it's so dependent on external water. It's dependent on its aqueducts. Uh, and you can kind of try to bring in some dramatic events that could potentially affect those aqueducts, uh, such as an earthquake or an act of terrorism tragic mistake on an aqueduct that would cut off LA from just a huge proportion of its water to really bring home this idea of how important local sources of water are, such as recycled or reused water, and also the predictability, like water that you can count on, and how much that really can be worth. I thought that was a really interesting angle. Okay. Um, I sat in on the physical design innovations panel, and um, I think it was really inspiring to find that uh, we, we're moving forward from just bemoaning the, the fact that uh, climate change is changing the way people can use the land, people can access water, uh, and moving on to design, sort of how do we respond to this, to this problem. Um, I listened to a presentation on solutions that authorities and private institutions in Africa are taking to solve the water problem. And um, 
I, I find it quite not notable that um, four billion people have no access to to continuous water. They have no access to continuous water, and at least I think uh, close to a billion of those people are in Africa, where we have nine hundred million people, um, mostly rural communities, people without access to water. So I would like to hear more about the solutions that private institutions and governments are putting into place to sort of recover the water that's being lost to waste. Um, I just wanted to say thanks to everybody for the presentations. They were really great today. It was very impressive. Um, I was I enjoyed all the presentations I went to. Um, it was really encouraging to see an interest in people who are in a very academic setting wanting to translate some of these ideas to the general public. I think I heard that a couple different times about an interest in communicating these issues that are so pertinent to everyone. Um, and a couple, I was surprised just to learn about the, the seemingly total lack of regulation of groundwater, um, definitely here in California and in other places. Um, and in terms of a story, I was, uh, I was interested in something that Malcolm Potts was describing in his presentation. Um, and if I were to write a story, I might call it, the Iran solution uh, does a Muslim fa family planning strategy hold the solution to global global overpopulation? Um, so yeah, that that was that was my biggest takeaway. But I uh, just wanted to say thanks. By the way, before we we continue, um, we do have a journalist in the room, Orville um, Mark. If you want to jump in with any kind of observation on this subject, be happy. Any okay? Um, so, Mark, to We don't have that much time, but if you were to imagine, oh, sorry, <laughs> if you were to imagine like a um, a day's newspaper on this particular uh, day, uh, what would be the stories? Like quick headline, like 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 just we're looking at the top of the fold of a of a newspaper or or even a, a let's say a weekly magazine that was sort of trying to capture some of these themes. I was just wondering if there's any kind of themes that jumped out at you, which which also may help tell people in the audience essentially what kind of registered and what didn't. In a, in a certain way. So just maybe very quickly, I don't know if that, you can do that rapidly. The imaginary. I have one, to start with. Yeah. Um, um, what happens in China is going, to, is, is, is going to dictate what happens, I think, across the globe in many ways. When I heard the, the numbers about the coal consumption, it was just staggering. Thing that really jumped out for me, uh, Zach kind of talked about it, was, um, you know, I asked a question about, you know, it seems like global warming is going to push down uh, the economics in the future. And they said, well, not really for the rich world. And that just brings to my mind, okay, so we're going to be okay, but are we okay with letting millions of people die or be trans, you know, forced from their homes? What kind of world is that? And how do we, how do we make people take actions in their own lifestyle to prevent that from happening. Go ahead. Tim. I think we would have an editorial um, that talks about the work that um, Margin is doing. Um, and, and looking at that, in most countries, people say, in the United States, people say the EPA is ineff inefficient, it's ineffective, it's not holding corporations accountable. But here you have non-governmental organizations and civilians taking the initiative to collect this data and um, distribute it and actually do what a federal agency would normally be doing. I think it's not, it's not up to the government to, to regulate and keep corporations accountable. One motive, that I, one motive that I heard throughout the day from a few people, and I think it would be a it could be a headline that summarizes um, the overall theme pretty well, is that we don't have any substitute for water. We have substitute mm -hmm. for fossil fuels. Yes, mm -hmm. we can figure that out. But water, there is no other substance that we could use instead. 
That, that's something I think the public will re could respond to. That's a pretty powerful, easy, easily graspable way to to articulate it. Um, any others? We talked about a couple. Zach, you had Zach had oh, one. We're doing a headline now. Okay. <laughs> 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 All right. Well, okay. So I got, um, will we run out of rice? And so that, um, that was, uh, Mr. Alfhammer. Yes. And, uh, and, uh, Orville Shell, um, talking about, well, okay. So rice, uh, as I understand is basically the world's biggest staple crop. Um, most of it is grown in Asia. Uh, and so, as, as Asian populations swell, Himalayan glaciers uh, are depleted, aquifers are depleted, and rising temperatures hurt growing conditions. Um, you know, how does Asia deal with, you know, how does it find new ways to supply its growing population? Um, another, another one that I thought of was, uh, um, I think it was from... Sally Thompson's presentation, I believe, um, just talking about Australia and how weather extremes in Australia, what could they tell us about the future of weather extremes in California, um, since they're similar ecosystems? I want to do a story about um, this partnership between Jerry Brown and uh, whatever province it may be, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have a conversation with you, Orville. Um, All right. Um, we also uh, we also you know we talked about we, we you know one of the things that we um, um, talk about in class all the time is how to put a human face on these stories. I think let's talk a little bit about that in terms of what you heard today and potential for um, stories that will reach a wider audience than the usual and also go beyond sort of the gloom and doom. It's real. This is this is a difficult. This is a difficult difficult. Uh, issue to get a handle on for, for a number of reasons. It's diffuse. It's slow moving, but um, also it tends to be very depressing as a as a subject. Um, so let's talk a little bit about that. Did you hear anything today that we could use to turn you know, these into stories that have a real human face and going to engage people and maybe not overwhelm them um, with the uh, the difficulty of the problem? Did you hear anything? Doomy and gloomy right now. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, 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 it seems insurmountable quite often, but uh, I think that's why it's important to come to these kinds of things and see what people are doing um, from all these different, um, from the entire spectrum uh, of the sciences, from engineering to, to climatology. Um, Story ideas? You got one, Zach? I mean, <laughs> I, 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 w I was really interested in the trees, which is, I, I think people um, here in Northern California care deeply um, about our trees. And um, that's something I'll be looking into, uh, Todd. But um, as far as human faces, I mean, you can always help us as journalists connect to people. We're going to be able to connect to a, uh, to a wider audience if we have people um, that are impacted by these uh, changes. I, in another part of my life, I work at the Center for Latin American Studies. We recently are screened a movie called No, about the plebiscite in Chile against uh, Augusto Pinochet. And they had to come up with a campaign that was that what made people excited about voting no. <laughs> and that's kind of how I felt about this. Like, how do you make this cheerful and happy? You know, like, get rid of a dictatorship. Yay! Um, and, and, I, and I guess that's one of the things I was thinking throughout the day. Like, how can you make this... A, a positive story that people want to be about. And I think that's a really hard thing to do. And it's a hard thing to do, and yet at the same time, you want them to understand how grave it is, but at the same time make them feel like there's a future that they can look forward to and be happy about and want to join. Um, and I don't think I have that story at the top of my mind, but it did occur to me that if the more you can think of those things, that some pe something pe people can be a part of. One thing that you mentioned was that you know people taking the photos of the polluters, where people are putting their faces on it and getting getting out there themselves, taking an action themselves, um, things like that, maybe are something people can. Yeah, I I agree. I I think um, that's a challenge that we 
we come at from a different perspective because I think for people to be care, to care about these topics, they have to engage with individuals who are who are impacted by them in some way. And so, whether it's a character like an individual who's affected by um, a drought or a giant redwood tree that's going to be affected by changes in fog, like I think readers have to identify in some way with these stories. And I think that's one of, I think that's our job to come up with those, those people and, or those things that allow readers to identify. Um, and I think that's maybe not something that's always reciprocated in the same way, the way you guys approach your, your subjects. But um, we definitely need you for this information. So that's, that's what we look for. Oh, were you going to say something? Or? Yeah, um, going back to going back to China, I didn't get I didn't I didn't I didn't get to grasp uh, the level of pollution in China until until you said that um, sometimes you can't even let your kids out of the house. I think um, talking about how many millions of tons of uh, carbon are being released into the atmosphere. Um, it, it takes a lot of research to get that data, but it's not accessible if we can't personalize it, I think, to, to the individual level. And, I, and w once you can relate it to a family, to an individual, then it's a lot more accessible, and I think it's, it becomes easier to convey the immensity of um, the conditions. I second, I second both of these messages because... Um, Researchers are trained, we just spoke about this, uh, researchers are trained to avoid thinking about a case study or individual um, people within the, affected by the things that they study. And we cannot afford that. That is the only thing, well, that's the main thing we're interested in extracting from you. So be prepared for that. We're going to come to you and try to understand the general implications of, of what you study and what your findings are. But we need to have this human face that Edwin is talking about. Um, otherwise, we cannot make this story a compelling one. I, I think, I mean, we've touched on, I think, um, from my standpoint, um, um, because I, I do a great deal of writing, and I write primarily environmental stories for National Geographic. And... Um, um, not only am I looking to to particularize and 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 anchor the issues in the lives of of real human beings, um, I'm I'm looking for ways to convey that people are taking action in their life in some way. Um, the most current story that I wrote for Na National Geographic, which will appear next year, is a upbeat climate change story. You know, it's about a, a First Nations group in a remote part of Manitoba that in its effort to regain sovereignty over its ancestral lands also happened to save uh, a Yellowstone Park-sized chunk of the uh, pristine boreal forest. And they were supported by, once, once, peop, once in big enviro groups found out what was going on, they got on board to help them. And, you know, by God, I mean, it was like a 25-year-long haul uh, when they first, when the, this group first showed up in Winnipeg um, to um, share their management, their land management plan with the government, you know, the first reaction was, "Who are you? To who gave you permission to write a land management plan?" Um, and they were quite patient about it and kept coming uh, back. Uh, they, 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 the way, the way one of the leaders uh, put it to me is that. Uh, we were told that the er the area of our ancestral territory was unoccupied, and our job for 10, 15 years was to prove to the provincial government that we exist and we actually live there. Um, so this story has a really strong and uh, uh, climate change aspect to it, uh, but I think it's going to be broadly appealing because not only does it have a human face, it has human beings who are actually trying to do something. It doesn't, it doesn't have to be that uh, they are all success stories. I think any story that has uh, people that readers can identify with who are doing something, um, 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 are, they're, they're empowering and they give people enough hope to, uh, they certainly don't uh, oppress them with hopelessness. Um, so I think that's a really important part about it. There's a whole lot of environmental writing 
for many years that was about the issues, and it was um, a lot of self-righteousness and, and a, lo um, um, a lot of um, sort of uh, 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 disjunct between the conflicts and the real lives of people, especially in terms of things like jobs um, and you know local local factors and dynamics that um, need to be taken into account whenever um, uh, uh, whenever a big environmental issue is at stake. And uh, my um, one of my north stars, one of my many north stars, is that I'm always looking to see who's going to be affected most. You know, often in environmental situations, we, they, the, the conversation is about let's bring all the stakeholders to the table. But that's really misleading in, in many ways because there's certain people at the table who have a lot more to lose than other people. Um, and I think we need to, as environmental writers, need to be, pay particular attention to the, to the latter group, the, the, people who, um, uh, the people who stand to lose more in any, uh, any particular situation. The more we do that, I think we'll be able, the more we can communicate we can go beyond preaching to the choir and communicate with other people on, on these issues of, of major concern whose opinions haven't hardened one way or the other. Um, Zach? Oh, I just want to say, you know, at least from, for probably all of us sitting up here at the table, you know, whatever else it is, it's a pretty exciting time. <laughs> I mean, Especially if war breaks out. <laughs> Nothing like a good conflict for, for a journalist. Um, any, any, uh, any, we only have a few more minutes here, five more minutes. Any, any questions or provocations? Yeah. There was a time when uh, denying that cigarettes caused cancer was respectable. And somewhere in our history, there was a transition, and it became not only uh, uh, thought of as not respectable, but also as somewhat evil. And I'm wondering if that transition is likely to occur in the climate denier area, uh, and also whether journalism might um, be, play a role in bringing that out. It's, a lot of journalism is still on the one hand, on the other hand, and I think that the consensus that we hear today from people who are spending a lot of time on this issue is um, there really isn't a, a scientific issue. And I'm wondering how you think journalism may deal with that. Yeah, go ahead. Just real quick to clarify, you're talking about kind of the propensity from a more traditional sense of journalism to kind of give equal weight to the 99% and then that 1% of denial. Is that a, well, a bit of what you're talking about? particular, what caused the transition for cigarette deniers from respectability to a, an evil force? Well, have you seen the movie The Insider? You can, there's a guy named Lowell Bergman who teaches at the journalism school in the, the IRP. Um, had a, I think, is it fair to say, a, a big role in, in um, kind of getting that story told to a, to a larger audience that uh, the cigarette companies knew that uh, cigarettes were addictive and harmful and all that. Um, Again, is are you talking about kind of the the difference between in terms of climate change the ninety nine percent the just tackle it okay there's an article in the New York Times uh, this week um, kind of a back and forth with Glenn Greenwald and he's talking about a new model of journalism in which we don't give equal weight in which we just call a spade a spade and say you know what climate change is happening let's not give equal weight to this we can admit that these people exist and that and that they're out there but we are kind of at a crescendo of importance in, in terms of a lot of issues uh, in the country and around the globe, and climate change is one of them, for sure. Um, it just depends on who you talk to and what model of journalism they follow. I, I, this is probably a good place to end because I think we, we, have, a, we have a big job to do, too. We, we haven't done a very, very good job as, a, as, a, as an industry, I think, in, co in covering um, uh, climate change properly. And part of it is this false equivalence thing that's going on. I think it has to, it, it, it has to end if we're, we're going to begin to turn around uh, people's understanding and uh, uh, an appreciation of what's at stake. Yeah.